never loan your car to anyone to whom you've given birth. The only reason I would take up jogging is so I could hear heavy breathing again. When Irma Bombeck died in 1996, we lost one of the world's greatest humorists. Life magazine declared her Socrates of the ironing board. Irma's column ran in more than 900 newspapers. She wrote 15 books, nine of which were New York Times bestsellers. She was on ABC TV's Good Morning America for 11 years. And as journalist Ellen Goodman remarks, a lot of columnists write to end up in the congressional record or at the Pulitzer Committee's door. But Irma Bombeck went us all one better. Her words won her the permanent place of honor in American life, the refrigerator door. Irma Louise Feist was born in Bellbrook, Ohio in 1927 to working class parents. They lived on Hedges Street in Dayton and her father, Cassius Edwin Feist, was a crane operator. Her mother, also named Irma, married Irma's father when she was just 14 years old and had Irma at the age of 16. Cassius, Irma's father, was 33. Once during an interview, Irma Jr. remarked that her mother had been raised in an orphanage and had just a fourth grade education. Irma Sr. snapped back with, you've screwed things up as usual. You said I had a fourth grade education. That is not true. Your father had a fourth grade education. I had a sixth grade education. The Feist family didn't have much money, but they always had enough for tap dancing lessons. Irma's big sister, Thelma, who was her father's daughter by his first marriage, took tap and when Irma was five, she took them too. Years later, Irma would say that she hadn't been very good, but she was good enough to secure a spot tap dancing on a local radio show called Kitty Review. And she danced on that show until she was 13. Thelma, who was seven years older than Irma, started school in the fall, and Irma used to sit on the stoop and wait for her to get home. By the time Irma was five, she and her mother had convinced the principal at Wilbur Wright Elementary that Irma was ready to start school. She couldn't read yet, but she loved books, and she had a great imagination. She would take a big paper bag to school and fill it up with books. Later, talking about her own children, Irma said, I have passed on my impatience, my love of pasta, and my excitement for reading books. Irma dreamed of becoming a writer one day, but she knew that if she told her mother, she would never hear the end of it. Irma Sr. was a bit of a stage mother, pushing Irma into performance, and little Irma was more interested in writing. Irma Jr.'s dream was to write, and struggling writers now find comfort and inspiration in her words. It takes a lot of courage to show your dreams to someone else. When Irma was nine, her father suffered a fatal stroke and died. He had a condition called polycystic kidney disease, which Irma would inherit and pass along to her two boys, Matt and Andy. After her father's funeral, their home was filled with people Irma didn't know, and everything was very confusing for her. Big sister Thelma went back to live with her mother, and the Feists had their furniture repossessed, they were out of their home, there was no life insurance, and Irma and her mother were broke. They went to live with Cassius's parents in the Haymarket district of Dayton, a section of Dayton that was much poorer than the one Irma was used to living in. The Haymarket district was around 5th and Wayne, now the Oregon district. But Irma was a little girl and was very adaptable. She really loved the variety of cultures and languages that came together, and her grandparents' house was crowded with relatives. 
Irma said that her best friend lived above a funeral parlor, and for something to do, they used to go to all the churches in the neighborhood. She said, we went to the synagogue on Saturdays and the Catholic church on Sundays, and I was a Protestant. Irma also became the only child in her class whose mother worked outside the home. Irma Sr. worked for the Leland Electric Company and then at General Motors. When Irma Jr. was 11, her mother, now 27 years old, married Albert Tom Harris, and the family moved to Oak Street in Dayton. Tom Harris was just 23, 12 years older than Irma Jr., more like an older brother, and Irma, understandably, was resentful of the place he'd taken in her mother's attentions. But she soon started eighth grade at Emerson Junior High, started getting involved with the school paper, the owl, and her home life got better. Not surprisingly, her favorite subject in school was English, and she especially liked humorous writing. Her favorite authors were Robert Benchley, James Thurber, and H. Allen Smith. She did write short and funny pieces for the school paper, The Owl, poking fun at the cafeteria food, kids in the in crowd, and occasionally teachers. Most of it was innocent enough, but once in a while she went a little too far and found herself in the principal's office talking her way out of a suspension. Irma attended Patterson Vocational School and was made features editor in her journalism class. She flourished under the guidance of English teacher Jim Harris. The Patterson classes were set up so that students could attend class for two weeks and then work for two weeks. Irma had her classes set up, but she hadn't yet landed a job. That didn't really seem to bother her. She marched right down to the managing editor of the afternoon newspaper, The Herald, and she told him she needed a job. He was a little surprised and said, well, we don't hire part-timers. Irma took a moment and she said, I know another girl who'll work part-time. You hire us both and you've got one full-time worker. He liked her moxie and Irma was hired on as a copy girl. She did everything from mixing paste to running errands to answering the telephone. It was exciting being in the newsroom, but it wasn't quite what she'd had in mind. When she managed to interview Shirley Temple, who was in town promoting a movie, One 16-Year-Old to Another, Irma's article appeared in the back folds of the paper, but she was a published writer in her city's newspaper. While working at the Herald, Irma fell hard for a copy boy named Bill Bombeck. He worked for the Dayton Journal, the city's morning newspaper, and went to Chaminade High School in the afternoon. Shy Irma was too busy studying, writing, and working at the paper to get out much, and Bill was known to date a few girls at the same time. They dated a few times, but after Bill graduated, he joined the Army and shipped overseas. Irma graduated from Patterson and expected to go to college. But remember, her mother had just a sixth grade education, and neither she nor Tom had money to send Irma to school. Plus, they saw education as a waste of money for a girl who was probably just going to get married and have children and be a housewife anyway. Irma was pretty upset about it, but in Irma fashion, she pulled up her bootstraps and went to work. She got a full time at the newspaper, which had recently merged to become the Dayton Journal Herald, and then she worked at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base at night, where she edited proofs for airplane manuals. At the paper, she was assigned to write the obituaries, where her humor and witty prose were useless. Plus, she wasn't much for checking her facts. Her mother said that about the only thing Irma ever got right was to have the people die in alphabetical order. Once she saved enough money, though, Irma headed off to Ohio University in Athens. 
That turned out to be a disaster for her. She couldn't get a job on the school newspaper and she was earning poor marks in all of her favorite classes. Her guidance counselor told her she'd never cut it as a writer. She should just quit and go home. Depressed and discouraged during her first semester, Irma wrote to her mother and told her that she wanted to come home to Dayton. Her mother welcomed her with open arms. Once home, Irma enrolled at the University of Dayton in 1945 as a journalism major. True to her hard-working nature, she got a full-time job at Reich's department store editing their employee newsletter. She wrote humorous articles poking fun at the lunch menus because food is always funny, the clearance racks, the elevator, and shoplifting for the RK. Plus, she got two part-time jobs all while going to school. She was a termite control account manager at an advertising agency, and she managed public relations for the local YMCA. UD was small, more relaxed, and the perfect place for Irma. The philosophy and psychology classes she was taking influenced her writing, and she began to produce pieces that were more thoughtful and circumspect. During her sophomore year, brother Tom Price, a journalism professor who had seen some of her work, asked her to submit a few articles for the university magazine, The Exponent. After reading her work, he slipped her a note with three words that would encourage and sustain her throughout her writing career. You can write. It was just what she needed. Irma was over the moon, and Bill Bombeck was back in the picture, too. He had returned from Korea in 1948, enrolled at UD himself, and the two revived their friendship. Irma converted to Catholicism, and after she graduated, she and Bill married in August 1949 at the Church of the Resurrection. Irma worked at the paper until she and Bill tried to start their family. She was relegated to the women's section, and Irma wound up writing housekeeping tips and product evaluations, neither of which held much interest for her. She couldn't have cared less about housekeeping, and she wasn't really a very good cook at the time. She once told her college friend, Shirley Fleischman, why clean your oven all the time? As long as you can still get a cupcake in there without touching the sides, you're in good shape. Writing obituaries, housekeeping tips, and boring product evaluations were not what Irma had in mind, and it wasn't long before her regular column, Operation Dust Rag, began to take on Irma's sense of humor. Nothing was off limits. She poked fun at doing the laundry and cooking, and this was right after World War II, when being a housewife was akin to sainthood. Irma's editors weren't sure what to think of a woman who said, housework, if you do it right, will kill you. Bill graduated from UD with a degree in education and took a job teaching science at Centerville High School. He and Irma tried to have a baby for four years before they eventually adopted a blue-eyed baby Betsy in 1954 from Catholic Social Services. And despite having been told by her doctors that there was no way she would conceive, Irma became pregnant with Andy in 1955 and Matthew in 1958. With three children under the age of four, Irma was busy all the time. What fodder for her columns. She loved her new role, but she also missed that part of her that loved to write. To help out, she edited the Dayton Shopping News. It wasn't the New York Times, and it was mostly filled with ads, but she wrote promotional pieces for a couple of the advertisers, and she published them in the paper. The Bombecks moved to 162 Cushwa Drive in Centerville in 1955 
to be closer to the high school where Bill was teaching. He also picked up side jobs as the neighborhood handyman, mowed lawns, and even worked at the post office on Maple Street during the summer months. Irma said, I would take decorating classes. I would crochet little knobs for the doorknobs with Santa Claus and little whiskers. I would make taffy for the kids, drive the carpool, take them on field trips, volunteered like crazy. It just kept me very busy. It was a young and bustling little neighborhood of growing families and most of the moms were in the same boat. Describing her life back then, Irma once quipped, we used to say, if the Virgin Mary had lived on our block, we would have said, of course she had time to go to the dentist. She only had Jesus. One day, Irma was looking out her back window and saw a new neighbor struggling to pull something out of what appeared to be a toilet. Irma went over to see if she could lend a hand that actually turned out to be a diaper and she made a friend for life. It was a local reporter new to town, Phil Donahue, Oprah, before Oprah was Oprah. The two became fast friends and Irma confided in him. She said that talking to him convinced her that she could still be a mother and be successful at writing. She should just go for it. She said, I was 37, too old for a paper route, too young for social security, and too tired to have an affair. So that's what she did, right. In 1964, Irma brought some of her articles to Ron Ginger, the editor of the Kettering Oakwood Times. Her style reflected her writing philosophy, hook them with the lead, hold them with laughter, and exit with a quip they'll never forget. Ron liked what he read and set Irma up with a new column called Zone 59, Centerville zip code. She'd get $3 for her weekly column. Irma wrote Zone 59 in her small bedroom office for a year and a half before her old employer came knocking. Glenn Thompson, the executive editor of the Journal Herald, told Ron Ginger he was going to steal Irma from the Times, and he did. He gave her a raise of $45 a week for three columns, and at wit's end debuted. Within three weeks, Thompson had sent samples of Irma's work to Newsday Syndicate, who enthusiastically agreed to sign her. Thompson was paying a fraction of the cost to carry at wit's end, and Irma's work was syndicated by 38 newspapers. An excited Irma told her family at dinner that night that she was going to be a newspaper star. No one stopped eating. No one said anything for a long time until a disgruntled Betsy finally looked up and said, does this mean you're not going to be able to take me to Scouts on Tuesday? Son Matt said that when they were little, they had no idea what mom did for a living. We told everyone she was a syndicated communist. By 1996, 500 newspapers carried at wit's end. Irma had found an eager audience. Irma wrote, Insanity is hereditary. You can catch it from your kids. Her humor struck a chord all across America. At wit's end, a compilation of her columns was published in 1967 by Doubleday and made Irma Bombeck a household name. She changed syndicates to Universal Press, and soon her column was carried by more than 700 newspapers. She and Bill moved the family to a farmhouse in Bellbrook in 1968, and Irma wrote for magazines such as Good Housekeeping, Reader's Digest, Ladies' Home Journal, and Red Book. Irma wrote 15 books, including If Life is a Bowl of Cherries, What Am I Doing in the Pits? 
and the grass is always greener over the septic tank, which sold a half a million copies in hardback. When told that the grass is always greener could command six figures, she snapped, don't tell my husband. While speaking in Arizona, Irma fell in love with the beauty of the desert, its vastness, the majesty, the sunsets over the beautiful McDowell Mountains, the friendliness of the people, and no doubt, the weather. The Bombecks moved to Paradise Valley in the Phoenix area in the early 1970s. Irma wrote her column and toured the country, making people laugh. It could not have been better timing for a generation of women looking to buck society's trends. They quickly identified with a woman who said, seize the moment. Think of all those women on the Titanic who waved off the dessert cart. Soon her column was carried twice a week in 900 newspapers with an audience of 30 million readers. Irma was appointed to the President's National Advisory Committee for Women and worked for two years to get the states to pass the Equal Rights Amendment. She said she wanted to make a difference for her children. She said, I would classify myself as a non-violent mother of three unplanned children. I have been married to the same man for 31 years with whom I've never had a meaningful conversation in my entire life. I iron by demand, have a daughter who is 26 years old and has no curiosity as to how to turn on a stove. And I have two sons who make Cain and Abel look like Donnie and Marie Osmond. When the bill didn't pass, she was deeply disappointed. She said, the ERA cause equality of rights under the law may be the most misunderstood word since one size fits all. For 11 years, beginning in 1975, Irma appeared on Good Morning America, offering her insight on the everyday mundaneness of life. She developed The Grass is Always Greener into a movie and then wrote and produced a TV show called Maggie, which was a tough schedule. She was not only writer and producer, but she had to relocate to Los Angeles to oversee production. When the show was canceled due to low ratings, she was disappointed, but she was also exhausted. She returned to Paradise Valley where she and Bill built a beautiful Spanish-influenced home filled with color and comfort. In 1985, the Tournament of Roses Association chose as its theme a celebration of laughter and invited Irma Bombeck, the first journalist ever chosen, to be the Grand Marshal of the Rose Bowl Parade. Irma gladly accepted. She said that what she really wanted, though, was to be named Queen of the Rose Bowl. But she said, I just couldn't hold my breath to hold my stomach in for two hours. She also decided to leave Good Morning America. She was preparing her book, Motherhood, the Second Oldest Profession, for Broadway, and had just begun work on a new book, family, the ties that bind and gag. In 1987, she became a lifetime trustee of the University of Dayton. Still, Irma was looking for a project with more meaning and she found it right down the street. At first, Irma was apprehensive about accepting an invitation to visit Camp Sunrise. It was a camp for children with cancer, but she spent three years with the kids, interviewing them and spending time with their families. Her writing took on a serious and more poignant tone, but it still managed to carry that Irma humor. Irma said that talking with the kids had taught her an important lesson and changed the way she thought. She said, if you can't handle optimism, don't hang around with kids with cancer. Her book, I Want to Grow Hair, I Want to Grow Up, I Want to Go to Boise, 
earned a lot of money for the American Cancer Society and was actually named for a little boy's three wishes. She said, things that were important before don't seem worth worrying about anymore. I'm more of a one day at a time person. I think about that three-year-old boy who threw his arms around me and he said, you know what, I'm going to the circus. And the counselor corrected him, saying they were actually going to go swimming. Without skipping a beat, the little boy said, I'm going swimming. And Irma said, it didn't matter. That little boy would have been just as excited at the opening of a bottle of aspirin. And I thought to myself, little things, they matter. After her book was published, Bill and Irma traveled the world, and they visited some pretty exotic locations. Their trips inspired her book, When You Look Like Your Passport Photo, It's Time to Go Home. Its message, besides Irma's funny stories about traveling the world, was to slow down and enjoy the ride. She said, if you want to leave your kids something special, leave them a part of the world. In April 1992, Irma developed and was treated for breast cancer. She still found time to write about her marriage and remarked, we've come to terms with ourselves. I'm not going to win the Pulitzer. Bill is not going to run the Boston Marathon in under three hours. We've seen the ruins of Tikal and we've kissed the Blarney Stone. Now we drink coffee on our patio in the morning and watch the birds, talk to our kids, a teacher, a writer, and a retailer, and bask in their accomplishments. We can comfort each other now as we have never been able to do before. Irma had been diagnosed with kidney disease when she was 20, but had been symptom free for most of her life. When her kidneys began to fail two years after her mastectomy, she had to wait until she was completely cancer-free before she could get a transplant. She administered dialysis at home four times a day while she waited. And even though she was an active spokesperson for the Arizona Kidney Foundation, she never asked for nor did she receive any special consideration. Bill Keene, who was a good friend and neighbor of hers, said that Irma always had something funny and just a little dark to say about her dialysis. In 1996, she was flown to San Francisco and underwent a successful kidney transplant, but she developed pneumonia and jaundice. Three weeks after her surgery, it was clear she would not recover. During the early morning hours of April 22, 1996, Irma Bombeck died at the age of 69, leaving many to mourn her passing. Irma and Bill, who passed away in January 2018 at the age of 90, are now together near their Phoenix boulder at Woodland Cemetery. In remarks after her death, Bill read one of his favorite columns, The Daddy Doll Under the Bed, and quoted Irma's philosophy. When I stand before God at the end of my life, I would hope that I would not have a single bit of talent left and could say, I used everything you gave me. Written in 1981, here is the daddy doll under the bed. When I was a little kid, a father was like the light in a refrigerator. Every house had one, but no one really knew what either of them did once the door was shut. My dad left the house every morning and always seemed glad to see everyone at night. He opened the jar of pickles when no one else could. He was the only one in the house who wasn't afraid to go into the basement by himself. He cut himself shaving, but no one kissed it or got excited about it. It was understood. Whenever it rained, he
he got the car and brought it around to the door. When anyone was sick, he went out to get the prescriptions filled. He kept busy enough. He set mouse traps. He cut back the roses so the thorns wouldn't clip you when you came in the front door. He oiled my skates and they went faster. When I got my bike, he ran alongside me for at least a thousand miles. He signed all my report cards. He put me to bed early. He took a lot of pictures, but was never in any of them. He tightened up mother's sagging clothesline every week or so. I was afraid of everyone else's father, but not my own. Once, I made him tea. It was only sugar water, but he sat on a small chair and he said it was delicious. He looked very uncomfortable. Once, I went fishing with him in a rowboat. I threw huge rocks in the water and he threatened to throw me overboard. I wasn't sure he wouldn't, so I looked him in the eye. I finally decided he was bluffing and threw in one more. He was a bad poker player. Whenever I played house, the mother doll had a lot to do. I never knew what to do with the daddy doll, so I had him say, I'm going off to work now, and I threw him under the bed. When I was nine years old, my father didn't get up one morning and go to work. He went to the hospital, and he died the next day. There were a lot of people in the house who brought all kinds of good food and cakes. We never had so much company before. I went to my room and I felt under the bed for the father doll. When I found him, I dusted him off and put him on my bed. He never did anything. I didn't know his leaving would hurt so much. I still don't know why. An engraved marker located several feet away indicates that author and humorist Irma Bombeck is buried at Woodland Cemetery. A massive 29,000-pound boulder from the Phoenix Desert serves as a monument. Per her wishes, her epitaph reads, I told you I was sick! A lot of people forget that Irma was just as skilled at writing more serious columns as she was at humorous columns. I'm going to leave you with one of my favorite Irma Bombeck columns originally printed from her May 12, 1974 Mother's Day column, and it's called The Day the Lord Created Mothers. When the good Lord was creating mothers, he was into his sixth day of overtime when an angel appeared and said, you're doing a lot of fiddling around on this one. And the Lord said, have you read the specifications on this model? She has to be completely washable, but not plastic. Have 180 movable parts, all replaceable. Run on black coffee and leftovers have a lap that disappears when she stands up, a kiss that can cure anything from a broken leg to a disappointed love affair, and six pairs of hands. The angel shook her head slowly. Six pairs of hands? No way. It's not the hands that are causing me problems, said the Lord. It's the three pairs of eyes that mothers have to have. That's on the standard model, asked the angel. The Lord nodded. One pair that sees through closed doors when she asks, what are you kids doing in there? When she already knows. Another here in the back of her head that sees what she shouldn't, but what she has to know. And of course, the ones right here in front that can look at a child when he goofs up and say, I understand and I love you, without so much as uttering a word. 
Lord, said the angel, touching his sleeve gently, go to bed tomorrow. I can't, said the Lord. Already I am so close to creating something so close to myself. Already I have one who heals herself when she's sick, can feed a family of six on one pound of hamburger, and can get a nine-year-old to stand under the shower. The angel circled the model of a mother very slowly. It's too soft she sighed. But she's tough, said the Lord excitedly. You cannot imagine what this mother can do or endure. Can it think? Not only can it think, but it can reason and compromise, said the Creator. Finally, the angel bent over and ran her fingers across the cheek. There's a leak, she pronounced. I told you, you were trying to push too much into this model. It's not a leak, said the Lord. It's a tear. What's it for? It's for joy, sadness, disappointment, pain, loneliness, and pride. You are a genius, said the angel. I didn't put it there said the Lord.